I'll turn it over now to our two uh, leads here. I'll just introduce mm -hmm. Nareth Carlisle as our uh, BEI lead for education technology, and he will introduce Egal Rosen, who really have taken on the, the, the starting point to this uh, topic when we kind of began incubating it. And I give them all the credit for what um, now will come forth, and I think it's going to be exciting. So, uh, Nareth, over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Eric. Welcome to everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Egal and I are delighted to be your guides in this uh, first seminar of the AI series. As uh, Eric had mentioned, Christina, um, a wonderful colleague from the BI and a very innovative medical education researcher, has agreed to be our chat moderator. So we'll invite you to add your questions and any experiences you've had with AI um, to the chat, and we will review that um, when uh, we get to the discussion at the end. Our goal in this series is to explore what artificial intelligence can teach us, really trying to explore the intersection of artificial intelligence and especially machine learning and clinical education. Artificial intelligence is a big area, right? It's rapidly expanding and it both benefits and suffers from a tremendous amount of lay interest and hype. While we recognize that clinical education is not the major driver of the expansion of artificial intelligence into medical practice, we do think that it's really important that clinical educators are one, informed about the core concepts of AI that are only gonna become more prevalent in the practice and teaching of medicine. Two, that you'll explore with us current and potential applications to medical education particularly in the areas of curricular design and delivery, assessment and learning. And then three, that we'll discuss and learn about some of the potential limitations or harms that we all need to be aware of, especially as we introduce this technology or evaluate it or have to explain it. It's through all of this that we have to explore in the, whole, in the series as a whole. So I'd like to share with you just briefly a little bit about each of the sessions and invite you to join us for all of them. Egal and I today are sort of gonna cover the basics uh, definitions and then work to ground our thinking together about applying AI to clinical education by choosing a specific area to discuss together, an area in which Egal has a, a lot of extensive experience through his other work and through his work in HarvardX particularly. Eric, um, well, supported by Egal and I, will extend this discussion in our second session and do some blue sky thinking about what a master clinical educator might wish for from AI and how we might think about it. Dr. Von Davier, who's Chief of Assessment at Duolingo, will bring her tremendous real world experience to, to, to her talk in diving into applications of AI to assessment in the October session. And then Dr. Christensen, who's CEO of Area 9, will also bring his deep real world experience to his talk on applications of AI to learning in our November session. And then finally, Igal and I will be hosting a hackathon in which we want to invite you to join us to do some hands-on work with some of the tools that we're gonna discuss. Returning to our topic today, um, we're gonna to briefly introduce ourselves and then we're gonna dive in. My name is Nareth Carlisle. I'm an internist and a clinical informaticist here at the Brigham. I'm on the faculty of the Informatics and Innovation Fellowship at Harvard Medical School. Uh, and I, as Eric had said, I'm the technology, education and clinical health informatics lead for the Brigham Educational Institute. Igal? Hello everyone, I'm Igal Rosen. I'm leading the research and development uh, of uh, AI and data science capabilities at BrainPop, which is really educational learning company. I'm also leading the project uh, for the first time assessment of creative thinking uh, for uh, young students as well. And I'm really excited to be here. Wonderful. Thanks, Egal. So our learning objectives today are really to understand some of the basic terminology of artificial intelligence, to explore how AI might impact clinical education, and then to try to understand how we might use machine learning to support developing and assessing mastery in the specific area sort of a clinical judgment. Egal is Senior Vice President um, for AI and Data Science at the Brain Pop, so what he said, as, as he said, he's co-founder of Talk Coaches, which uh, provides conversational agents for learning, uh, and he was previously Head of Research and Development at HarvardX. Um, I'm currently evaluating an open source computer vision system developed by Amazon. I was previously CMO and CIO at Activate Care, which uh, does some care automation in uh, complex care in the communities. And I'm currently co-investigator for the Pride Learning Network, which is funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And while we think these experiences have enriched our interest in this topic, none of these organizations have had any control over the content of our presentation today. So the history of the field of artificial intelligence has got a lot to teach us. Um, it's going to be a little complex. It's going to be a bit of a whirlwind, but I think it helps us to understand both the definitions in the field, what's been achieved so far, and what the goals of the field are, overall are. Interestingly, I would point out that the field is now in its third hype cycle. 
So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the previous ones because I think they'll probably have relevance. The field itself is amazingly 78 years old. Really, the inception of AI began in 1943 when Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts first proposed an artificial neuron. In 1949, Donald Hebb described an updating rule for modifying connections of these artificial neurons, something which is still used today and is called Hebbian learning. In 1950, Marvin Minsky and Dean Edmonds, who are still undergraduates here at Harvard, built the first neural network computer using over 3,000 vacuum tubes. That must have been fun. The seminal, field in the, uh, the seminal paper in the field uh, is published, was published in 1950 by Alan Turing. It's called Computing Machinery and Intelligence in the Journal Mind. And in it, he, he described many things, including the Turing test, which he described as the imitation game, which you might remember from the movie. This was both a way of testing if we have succeeded in creating artificial intelligence, as well as a means to help make more precise the problem of artificial intelligence. In this article, he also described machine learning, genetic algorithms, and reinforcement learning. Notably, and, and some of the things that we'll explore later in the talk, he also, um, in his later talks, provided some warnings about the potential negative implications of the applications of this kind of intelligence for humanity at our current stage of development. There was actually also a defining conference in the field, a two month workshop at Dartmouth College that was hosted, convened by John McCarthy in 1955. His proposal for that workshop provides a reasonable definition for artificial intelligence and highlights some of the key issues in the field. His proposal stated, this study is to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. An attempt will be made to find out how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans and improve themselves. Delightfully optimistic, which became characteristic of the field, he felt that a significant advance can be made in one or more of these problems if a carefully selected group of scientists work in it for a whole summer. The period following in 1952 to 1966 was one of early enthusiasm and a lot of success with general problem solving approaches in symbolic logic and reasoning within constrained problem domains. They were even called micro worlds. In 1966, there was the first dose of reality and the first AI winter occurred with a lot of funding being withdrawn. When it was realized that these general problem solving approaches were theoretically strong, but didn't really scale well to real world problems and so became considered weak methods. In 1969, work began within the community to focus on expert systems. These were rule-based systems informed by subject matter experts, and they did result in some impressive successes, including the Mycin system, which was an expert system that recommended empiric antibiotics for patients with bacteremia or, infection, or bloodstream infections. It was shown to provide more appropriate recommendations than junior doctors. Dell Equipment Corporation used systems, expert systems for automated planning and logistic support, saving $40 million per year in the early 1980s, as did the Defense Department. There were massive initial investments, especially from Japan and the US um, early in the 1980s, but by the mid 80s, interest started to wane, again leading to the second AI winter. In 1986, there was a lot of interest to start again in neural networks, which offered two key capabilities. One was the ability for the machines themselves to identify patterns. And the second was the ability for them to learn from additional examples. In 1987, Judea Pearl moved the field forward with his work on probabilistic reasoning and reasoning with incomplete data, which is so necessary for real world problems and for, for uh, problems in medicine in particular. By 2001, internet usage was expanding and massive data sets were becoming available for machine learning. And this allowed a quantum leap forward in, in image speech and text recognition accuracy. By 2011, more complex problems started to be tackled with increasingly complex and deeper layered neural networks, which we now call deep learning. It's estimated that each of us in this room probably um, uh, uses technology which relies on some kind of learning, uh, machine learning system for almost an hour a day. Unfortunately, it's largely used to target things for us to buy or to provide us with search results. So after that whirlwind tour, it's really important to just talk about what we think some of the key concepts are that we should just make sure that everybody understands. And this paper by Mesko and Gorog uh, in uh, Nature Digital Medicine provides an excellent reference that people can have on hand um, that will have uh, good AI 
<clears throat> terms defined in them. Four key terms, which I think medical professionals um, should have some familiarity with, especially as they relate to machine learning, are listed here. Supervised learning is a very commonly used type of machine learning, in which a training data set that has been annotated with correct labels by domain experts usually are used to train machines to correctly classify or to predict outcomes. You can think of a teacher observing every step of a student solving a problem and providing corrected feedback. Unsupervised learning is when we allow machines to create automatic classifications and groupings of data, and we use that output to determine if we're able to learn any new insights from these groupings. Reinforcement learning occurs when feedback is provided on the outcome, but not each individual decision. The learner then is able to optimize the individual decisions or steps to maximize um, the outcome that we want to achieve. And the classic example in AI here is giving a system only the rules of a game, and then telling it how it can tell if it's won or lost, and then letting it play against itself. The distinction between earlier neural networks and deep learning is shown in this diagram. Earlier neural networks, they're seen in A up at the top, used relatively few nodes and interactions to uncover simple features. Deep learning networks have many more nodes and many more connections, and they can therefore address more complicated problems, but they do require a lot more computing power. The number of nodes and the number of connections needed for types of problems is still being actively researched. While this seems complex, we want you to just keep in mind that right now there are only two major purposes of machine learning models, and that is classification or labeling and prediction. And you should also know that in practical AI, there's rarely a single winning model, but you typically apply multiple models to a problem and then you compare these against each other. And especially you'll then compare it against some kind of gold standard, which in complicated domains is usually an expert evaluation. So from this, I hope you'll see that, that while the neural network is really interesting and powerful, the data going in from the left-hand side and all of the embedded biases and the evaluation and the comparison of the output are gonna be critical factors for the quality of any machine learning system. And these are particularly complicated in medicine. Nevertheless, the approaches taken to date have had some incredible breakthroughs. And I've often thought of my master clinician mentors as being like chess champions, making complex diagnoses by balancing competing demands and thinking far ahead. And so I was blown away when I read that combining deep nets and reinforcement learning have produced stunning results in game playing, including reaching a world champion level in chess after only four hours of training, starting from just the rules of the game and learning from games that it's played internally against itself, right? That's a tremendous cognitive power within a specific domain. Egal, do you want to introduce? Sure, that's a great overview. Uh, now, I think the big question based on what uh, Nara just shared is really about the, the boundaries. You know, what are the limitations? What are the you know, possibilities from highly constrained, highly structured, uh, domains such as number of moves and you know in, in chess uh, play or in, in in some other domains where really the um, the, the number of possibilities is relatively uh, you know small or very very well defined and where uh, the gold standard as Narada just said of uh, subject matter expert is uh, really really straightforward. So we are going to look into some of the examples uh, in uh, kind of that. Uh, examine the boundaries basically of AI. And one of the examples is really coming from uh, uh, Samsung AI researchers just uh, two or three years ago that were able to showcase that some of those capabilities, as Nara just mentioned, classification and prediction can be applicable to some of the uh, more complex <laughs> domains such as uh, uh, visual expression or even written expression. So we might want to watch uh, this short movie first and then we will talk about some of the capabilities behind.
rate. So we can see that uh, basically we cannot just uh, use that capability to, you know, to, to classify or, or label certain features, right, in such a complex domain, such as, you know, say visual expression or painting, uh, but we can also predict basically how, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, different characters are going to, uh, you know, to look like when, uh, you know, it's kind of a transition from just one photo or one painting to the movement. And the key steps really what we would want to ground this conversation about is what are those key steps that uh, uh, kind of driving those capabilities. And uh, we know that uh, in order to generate some of those uh, um, capabilities, neural net, net, or nets, or you know some other models. Basically, we do need a real large amount of data usually, and this is what you see in step number one. The neural network model will learn the uh, facial expressions or landmarks on a large amount of data. This is really another additional space where there is significant uh, advancement uh, in recent years where, uh, you know, going from thousands of hundreds of thousands of uh, exemplars that basically we'll, we'll need to feed into those models uh, down to really just 50, 60, uh, really, uh, you don't really need that, uh, you know, significant data set really to train the models with more recent capability, especially in spaces where, you know, some of those capabilities are already grounded and well developed. Now, the next uh, part is really how you uh, uh, basically create this, uh, you know, prediction, right? So you can uh, classify different landmarks now, how you will be able to do the prediction itself. So basically, uh, being able to do that for many of those paintings or many of those use cases will create a better accuracy for us to, you know, to predict basically how this specific case, uh, you know, is going to behave. Uh, so what you see here is the style transfer laws is really the kind of the core uh, part of that, like what is really happening under the hood, right? Usually uh, when, you know, we're talking about or hearing about AI, or machine learning capabilities, it's really almost like a black box. It's just that like the magic is happening. <laughs> there is something on the input. Something is happening as a, like magic in, the, in this black box. And basically there is an output that is great, you know, or, 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 or suboptimal in, in, in some cases. So what exactly is happening in that, um, in that black box, which is really most of, the, most of it and the hidden right now in this step three. So this, uh, uh, in this example, this loss function uh, algorithm or, or model basically it is going to use three uh, basic steps. Uh, it, uh, basically, the content loss or the uh, you know the features that are being identified um, from this uh, you know they, they will be used to create the synthesized uh, image, right? So the style loss algorithm makes the synthesized image and style image uh, close in style and features, right? So it's all about the proximity to what uh, you know the original image. Uh, it, you know, is going to express. And then the algorithm is basically uh, um, calculating or estimating the variation loss that will happen to reduce the noise in the synthesized image. So basically we are, it, the big question always, and you might want to ask those questions in any of those uh, uh, use cases we are going to present or the ones that you're going to try out yourself is basically what we are trying to optimize for. Right, so in this case, we, it needs to be well defined. We are trying to optimize, as not said before, uh, uh, for a capability of uh, close to natural moves of those characters on the screen. Right, so this basically there is the kind of ground truth that we are trying to optimize for, and then the um, uh, uh, the reduction of the say noise or variations. This is basically the goal of this uh, algorithm. Uh, so then we try to extract those features and basically predict what is going to happen uh, with, with, the, with, the, with the outcome. When, the, uh, when we're training the model for this kind of style transfer, we continuously extract these content features and style features of the synthesized image and basically calculate the loss uh, function to be optimized so this more natural uh, moves. We'll talk about some of the, the steps in, a, uh, in a, some of our next slides, but this is really the core uh, you know, for us to kind of look at. Uh, whether it's about classification or prediction, and basically what are what is the training set that is being used, and what we are trying to optimize for uh, as the kind of the the you know the gold um, standard that we are, we are trying to achieve with the with the model. Wonderful, thanks, Igor. Still uh, amazing to see Mona Lisa talking. <laughs> Great. 
So AI is also having a big impact in clinical practice, right? And we're going to see that expand. So in their textbook, um, Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig have shown that AI algorithms now equal or exceed expert doctors at diagnosing some conditions, particularly when the diagnosis is based on imaging, right? And this is including um, diagnosing Alzheimer's or metastatic cancer in imaging scans, diagnosing diabetic retinopathy, as well as recognizing many skin diseases. And the research base is expanding significantly. So I'd highlight these lower two biggest circles, and they are radiology and pathology um, sp specifically. And then changes in technology can also change what we need to teach and train clinicians in. So this is going to be a, a clip from the middle of a video showing a nurse who had no previous ultrasound training using an FDA approved image recognition system who is now able to perform a diagnostic echocardiogram, something that we currently require and train cardiology fellows to do. On the left, the quality meter tells her how close she is to capturing a diagnostic quality image. As Sarah gets closer to the optimal view, the meter rises. Once the software detects a diagnostic quality image, the meter turns green and the clip is automatically recorded without having to press any buttons. Next, she moves to the apical 4 and the apical 2 chamber views. She follows the real-time guidance and continues making fine movements to enhance the image. You'll notice that with the addition of multiple views, the ejection fraction measurement displays automatically. And yet, uh, whatever happened to IBM's Watson? So as this New York Times article highlighted, grand promises were made and touted in the news press about Dr. Watson that did not materialize. And while Watson is still making progress in limited domains, the complexity of clinical medicine in a variety of fields, the noisiness of our data, and then the poorly tracked clinical outcomes likely mean that we're gonna to have to be circumspect in our expectations for replacement technologies for some time in, in general practice of medicine. Egal? Okay, so now from, from this uh, you know, great achievements and some of the, kind of the key concepts that we just shared so far, really we would want to transition the conversation to uh, the use of AI in the clinical edu education and of course in assessments or you know, certification con contact. But mainly we are going to look into some of the uh, challenges that we are trying to basically address or trying to help with uh, or trying to optimize for in the language we just introduced optimization that needs to happen with some of those uh, capabilities. Um, so in some of the uh, more recent articles, we see a lot of emphasis on uh, the uh, anticipated change that needs to happen in the, um, the medical uh, school curricula in general and specifically in, in, in training and some of the assessment uh, capabilities related to um, clinical judgment and some of the other you know, major cons constructs or skills and uh, capabilities for, uh, um, uh, for, for you know, professional capabilities, basically. And one of the major fields is really how we can um, uh, basically use AI in the most effective way uh, in, in the intersection between AI capabilities and what is really uh, the next frontier in the medical uh, education space. Uh, the, the key uh, challenge that is being of course, uh, discussed very significantly, increasingly uh, in, the, in the literature is really about the information overload that is caused not only by the volume of biomedical and clinical knowledge, but also by an increased pressure on learners uh, to demonstrate mastery through uh, licensing examinations and other forms of uh, assessment, basically to be ready uh, for the actual practice. So this is where we uh, see a lot of uh, applications of uh, AI technology and especially adaptive learning or adaptive uh, uh, formative assessment capabilities to basically drive mastery development and skill development and really pinpoint exactly where uh, you know, more attention is needed. Um, we will go to the next uh, slide and really uh, uh, in that context, uh, what we see in the field is that uh, basically uh, it's, it, the, the question is not really about kind of, uh, uh, you know, replacement conversation, like, you know, where AI can replace professors, it's really about how we can augment uh, uh, medical education and, you know, the actual application in the field with AI capabilities. So it's really human plus AI conversation and identifying where 
you know, the is certain benefits are very evident and where AI basically needs to, to bridge certain gaps in order to be more effective for humans, right? So human is in the center and basically we are looking into capabilities to augment uh, uh, human capabilities uh, to, to, to learn, to acquire, you know, acquire skills, acquire cap capabilities, but also in the actual uh, practice. And of course, in places where we identify certain, uh, what we call like superior results. So these are the places where this hybrid AI plus human uh, is probably going to thrive and going to uh, be extended. So really the skills um, uh, that are required of practicing physicians will increasingly involve uh, facility in collaboration with uh, and managing artificial intelligent applications that aggregate vast amount of data, generate diagnostic and treatment recommendation, and assign confidence rating to those recommendations in the practice. And of course, there is so much uh, uh, to do in terms of actual you know, medical education and uh, optimizing some of the ability to uh, develop mastery, cultivate mastery, but also identify uh, gaps and help uh, professionals to uh, reach uh, highest mas mastery possible. So this is where we're going to kind of pay a bit more attention in this uh, conversation and some of our uh, next uh, uh, seminars are going to really dive deeper into what is happening uh, in those systems and you know how what uh, they're trying to optimize for and how those uh, AI or machine learning capabilities will help to achieve that hybrid intelligence of uh, human plus AI as opposed to uh, superiority of AI or something that is really get driven by AI. It's really about this um, you know most effective uh, you know human plus AI uh, uh, capability. So we'll go to the next slide and we will uh, look a bit deeper into that concept of uh, personalized learning and how AI can help uh, uh, really to drive that human-centric uh, approach. And in that space, we know that there are a few concepts that we just wanted to kind of uh, you know, ground this conversation uh, with uh, one major concept that you probably have heard uh, a lot and, and, and have some knowledge about, I'm, I'm sure as well, is really this concept of uh, uh, adaptive, adaptive capability, adaptive engine, how we adapt learning. So uh, 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 adaptivity or adaptive capability really refers to systems that are capable of learning in real time about what works for uh, students or for learners. And uh, as students engage with uh, learning and assessment activity, we can basically optimize the uh, experience for a certain, uh, uh, say, you know, success criteria or certain outcome that we would expect, right? So there is certain outcome that we will set for optimization and basically adaptive system is expected to learn not just from individual learners, but really learners overall in that space with similar say, characteristics and basically optimize the uh, learning path. Uh, the second concept that you've uh, uh, heard a lot, I'm sure, this uh, personalized learning. So how those interact is it the uh, same concept, uh, what, but exactly is about, uh, is there about personalization? Uh, so when we talk about uh, ad 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 adaptive capabilities, really what is happening uh, from the, what we call it, adaptive engine standpoint, the more of a technology side, but from the learner standpoint, really the focus in personalized learning is to develop this, what we call, a human in the loop or human centric uh, algorithms that really are aiming to uh, automatically uh, not just discover but also assign activities based on actual performance and what is the optimization that is happening under the hood with this adaptive engine. Uh, so major emphasis is usually related to how we can un uh, unlock the potential of uh, providing uh, more uh, tailored learning uh, pathways as opposed to just like one size fits all learning pathway or activities to, to build mastery, right? So it's uh, this kind of the, the key concept of that personalization. Of course, uh, you can always ask what, uh, what are going to be the variables that are going to be used by the system personalization based on what, uh, you know, learner variables, what, what like, type of conditions uh, on, online, on site, you know, different types of conditions going to that. So basically more complex systems, more effective systems will take, um, a, you know, a really a more rigorous approach in terms of accounting for certain, uh, you know, variability as opposed to many systems, basically, as you can hear, you know, it seems like basically define themselves as personalized and adaptive, but uh, the, you know, when you look into what exactly is standing behind that, 
it's going to be like predefined activities basically assigned, right? So this is really not the, exactly what we mean by adaptive or personalized learning. It's really about what are those um, variables that are going to drive adaptive personalized learning as opposed to just a predefined, uh, say, a, 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 a limited number of those predefined activities. This is not really the type of personalization we are, or adaptivity we are looking at. Uh, the third concept just kind of uh, highlights some of the main uh, you know, concepts or capabilities is, is a little recommendation. Basically, what are those recommendations that are going to be provided uh, to the learners basically for, as, a, as a next step? So in some of the systems, it's going to be a, a more of a pick your uh, pathway capability. So there's going to be a number of those recommendations and the learner will be able to, uh, you know, to select the one that, you know, fits the best his or her style or, you know, intended uh, learning objective. In, in some other systems, it's going to be done uh, basically automatically, uh, driven by kind of optimization algorithm that uh, is, uh, uh, as we said, learning on the data and basically optimizing the uh, the learning pathway. In in a way, you can see that you know like a parallel to kind of the Netflix recommender or Amazon recommender, but uh, but the significant difference is of course uh, uh, related to the outcome we are trying to optimize for, right? So it's not necessarily about uh, you know, keeping you for more time uh, on the system, right? To kind of just uh, uh, make sure, you know, you have exposure to as many possibilities as possible. It's really about saving time and optimizing the learning process to achieve the learning outcomes we are trying to optimize for, right? So this is a very significant difference, of course, when you hear about recommender system, recommender engine uh, for, you know, say, uh, in consumer space as opposed to, of course, to learning uh, technologies uh, space in, that, in our case. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, and we just wanted to kind of ground some of the, our conversations in this first session around, um, uh, you know, some of the, say, requirements, some of the work that is done to inform those type of systems, uh, adaptive personalized systems, and of course, machine learning that is driving that uh, uh, capability for us. And this is just kind of a simplistic model that, but something that we can start with. Um, uh, basically, those systems are, uh, usually build around uh, a certain outcome, a certain construct or skill set that we are trying to optimize for, right? In most cases, uh, those uh, constructs, in this case, is going to be clinical judgment. It needs to be very well defined. And of course, the definitions are done by uh, subject matter experts. So usually a group of subject matter experts will, uh, you know, do the literature review and will kind of, uh, you know, adapt the model to the exact case uh, we are trying to optimize for. Uh, so in this case, clinical judgment, uh, we, again, this is a very high level model that you see right now on the screen, but just uh, even with this high level model, you can see, you know, the different components of the model. Uh, so we are saying that what are the patient or the client needs? Uh, there is an input that, you know, feeds into the system uh, that now the clinical judgment process starts. We're assuming that there are, uh, you know, uh, roughly three key steps that are, uh, basically there is an iteration that needs to happen. Uh, so the uh, clinical professional will, uh, you know, start with forming the hypothesis based on the medical records, based on the uh, uh, recognition of certain cues from the patient, from, from the client, analysis of those uh, cues, and then it will be uh, fed into the ability to re refine the hypothesis or modify the hypothesis, and then a certain level of prioritization. So what is going to be most likely uh, uh, you know, hypothesis in that in that case, and then basically evaluation is happening. So we assume that there is the uh, this kind of iterative process of uh, uh, forming hypothesis, and of course uh, having more and more information, more data to uh, inform those hypotheses, and then evaluation that needs to happen. And basically, uh, the you know the key outcome is going to be the actual uh, uh, clinical decision, or at least the emerging clinical decision, uh, especially in case where most critical uh, criteria is going to be uh, in, satisfied. So this is kind of the, the, the starting point, you know, to define the mastery model, this uh, algorithms are going to uh, optimize for. And then uh, the very essential piece of that is basically to account for um, variability that can happen across different cases, across different, uh, you know, settings. So uh, you can see additional uh, factors on layer four in this model that will, uh, uh, potentially account for the uh, significant variability that we can see. So, so basically, the clinical uh, clinical judgment process. Yes, the core of it is basically layer 
uh, you know, is zero to three, and then we have layer four that will suggest that there are individual factors that will go into this, uh, uh, in the considerations. So it's not just about this very, uh, you know, very analytical kind of a cognitive process. You have to make sure that you account for additional, uh, additional variables that are on the individual spectrum, and you account for uh, certain variables, or, you know, key drivers related to the environment the impact on, from the environment of this patient or of this client. So we'll go, not go into the details of each of those circles, but this is the uh, uh, very uh, critical, basically, step in those systems where we, when subject matter experts and humans, as we said, it's a hybrid model, uh, humans will uh, define that. And then, of course, we go into more and more ground level to the extent possible uh, to basically uh, create more accuracy for this machine learning uh, algorithm because uh, what it needs to happen is that we, uh, in the best case scenario, are able to, as a say, subject matter expert, this group is able to define prerequisites. Uh, so basically, any uh, you know relationship that is going to is going to be accounted uh, when we uh, you know evaluate whether or not uh, you know there are certain gaps in uh, in learner or student knowledge and, and capability. So this is the first uh, step, and usually what is happening is that. When this model is defined, just so the algorithm is not going to basically start from scratch from from kind of a cold state, uh, this model is going to be optimized over time. So basically, what we will see uh, over time, especially with more and more data uh, available for us, we will be able to generate, um, uh, for example, certain uh, if you know in the assessment uh, space we call it psychometric properties, basically of all of those different components, and we will to su to suggest to what extent. Uh, you know, certain components uh, carry more weight when it comes to mastery. So it is possible that certain components are uh, will, will carry more weight over others. It is very possible that there are certain uh, um, prerequisites that uh, will have to be added to the model, right? So then this is how basically a model will start to optimize itself. And again, subject matter experts in the loop, uh, always uh, looking into optimization that can happen that is uh, you know recommended based on data that we see from the machine learning model and then a decision will uh, need to be taken in some cases i can you know tell you we, we've seen that in rfdx and in other cases um, the complexity of uh, you know outcomes that we see from the algorithms from the machine learning algorithms is not usually easily uh, interpretable by humans so basically you have to define specific uh, uh, you know benchmarks specific criteria uh, that are, uh, you know, human interpretable <laughs> and can be uh, evaluated by subject experts to uh, basically optimize uh, the model. But so uh, can for the, the formula that we're, we're working with is the mastery model that will have to be well-defined, but it, this is never the final state of this model. Basically, we always optimize the model as uh, the, you know, we, we see, we look, we look into the performance of the algorithm, the machine learning algorithm, and we're looking into the outcomes we are trying to optimize for, which is really the most effective way to reach uh, mastery with the uh, learners or with the students. Okay, uh, so this is probably going to be uh, one of the more complex uh, slides. I'm hoping that you can see that uh, uh, reasonably on your, on your uh, screens. What we see here is really just uh, to give you a sense of um, the, you know, what is happening in this black box, right? Usually we, we said that uh, in this adaptive engine capabilities or machine learning models, you know, you, you kind of uh, uh, see the, kind of the highlights, like what uh, are the steps, but you don't usually see the more of a, uh, you know, the under the hood kind of capability and it's hard to, kind of, to really even evaluate to what extent it does what it, it, it is going to claim. Uh, that it's, it, it, it actually does. So what we see here is really the architecture we uh, developed and tested through uh, efficacy research at HarvardX and in collaboration with Microsoft. Um, so we uh, developed and deployed the, this type of capabilities of you know, adaptive learning, personalized learning to reach mastery across multiple uh, courses at Harvard, including you know, physics and uh, uh, language courses and uh, some of the courses uh, uh, available analytics from uh, Microsoft. And basically what we were testing for uh, uh, was uh, really to what extent um, this personalized adaptive pathways really lead to more effective way to reach mastery in terms of you know, time and in terms of actual uh, you know, proficiency level that we can uh, reach with those capabilities. So what you see, I'm just 
going briefly to explain what, what we see on the screen. So we'll start from left-hand side, LMS, Learning Management System. So it could be Canvas in Harvard context uh, or you know, edX or any of those uh, systems that basically uh, provide the UI, the user interface to the learner, right? So the learner needs to have basically the ability to see, you know, what is the next activity to focus on or even or be able to select from choices that are available. So this is the user facing side of the, um, of the learning system. But really what is happening within the system, these are, as you can see here, the, the bridge for adaptive learning uh, uh, below, you can see the adaptive engine that we will talk about uh, in just uh, just a minute. And we have the content source. So content really, those are the activities, right? The learning activities, assessment activities, any external resources that are available like simulations or data manipulatives that uh, learners will be able to uh, to work with. So the big kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, activities happening with between basically the bridge and the adaptive engine. So we um, uh, we are basically looking into the performance of our learners, you know, starting from, you know, uh, the first activity they're engaged in. And basically we're trying to optimize for uh, for more effective way to reach uh, mastery. So we uh, basically have to, on the adaptive engine side, we have to always basically update the student state, you know, to what extent the student, uh, you know, shows uh, proficiency in certain parts of this competency model or mastery model we shared before. And uh, just, you know, high level, we would want to provide the recommendation for the next activity to focus on, right? So this is very simple kind of a, a diagram just to understand that there is adaptive engine that is driving those um, activities. Now we will look into what is happening within the adaptive, adaptive engine itself. Uh, next slide, please. So within the adaptive engine itself, basically what is happening is that uh, we apply this, uh, uh, you know, classic, classical uh, process of seven steps of machine learning. And I would invite you to, you know, look into those uh, steps or any, uh, any part of that process also in our next uh, 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 webinars. Uh, really the, 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 you know, the typical process is going to be that we, you gather data and of course, uh, you know, in, those, in case of machine learning, you want to have uh, as much data as possible, as much variety as possible represented in the data. You uh, basically prepare this data to feed into the model. Uh, you know, and Narat mentioned a few of those models, uh, supervised uh, uh, as opposed to uh, unsupervised uh, reinforced learning. You know, it is possible that it's uh, neural nets or some other models, right? So usually we have a number of models that we can use and we try to see basically what model is going to be uh, uh, more effective for you know outcomes that we are looking at. So we are preparing this data. Uh, we are looking into performance of different models. We are choosing the most uh, the most e effective model that say classifies or predicts what we are trying to optimize for. Then we do training basically of this model, trying to reach a higher uh, you know precision. <laughs> possible and th this is this is the iteration that is happening so you train the model you do the evaluation and basically you do fine tuning of this model uh, trying to optimize for prediction right so these are the key steps that we are looking at in pretty much uh, uh, most of the machine learning uh, algorithms or capabilities this uh, process is very uh, uh, directly applied to what we see in the adaptive engine so basically what we are doing in the case of, of course, education and uh, uh, learning systems, we are, we are tracing knowledge or tracing skills uh, with uh, with our users or with our learners. And there are different models. Bayesian knowledge tracing is one of them. There is an ELO model that is also very um, applicable in those cases. But basically, we're trying to trace skills and knowledge uh, with each of the uh, learners. And then we are trying to basically optimize uh, knowledge tracing based on the um, the performance that, that we see with uh, uh, with actual learners. So we are looking into probabilities of uh, uh, guess, sleep, or knowledge transfer. We are looking into uh, the ability to capture prerequisites or relationship uh, prerequisites. In some cases, mastery model or uh, competence model needs to be updated because we actually see that uh, although one component has been defined as prerequisite, but actually in real in real world data, we see that it, this is not the case, right? So we, we basically need to surface that to the subject matter experts. And then this uh, knowledge tracing is uh, basically trying to 
uh, feed into the ability to predict what is going to be the most effective learning path that should be uh, uh, made available for the uh, learner. And then we are looking into different cases. Are we looking into remediation? Are we looking into continu continuation within the same uh, you know, the pathway uh, and so on? And then in that process, we always basically update the mastery profile of the learners to basically be able to say, at this point in time, we can tell you that you know, here you are, that this, uh, these are the concepts you, you mastered, these are the concepts you might need to, you know, to work on a bit more, and then we provide those recommendations uh, for the learners to, uh, you know, to be able to select from or just to be able to follow the recommended path. Great. Wonderful, Gal. Thanks. That was a tour de force. I know there's so much complexity that sort of was there, but those um, seven steps, I think, so useful to think through. Um, so today we've we've tried to cover the history of AI that we hope have informed a basic understanding of AI and machine learning terms. Um, we've discussed sort of what's thought in the literature and sort of um, what we think is going to be changed in AI and clinical education. And then Igal's, you know, walked us through so this grounding based on the work that he's done both at HarvardX and elsewhere on how do we think about applying uh, machine learning to assess to assessment and learning of uh, and mastery and clinical judgment. Um, so we have, um, you know, other slides, but I want to make sure that we have a chance to have some discussion uh, and any questions. We'd certainly welcome any feedback afterwards. And as I said, this is going to be a series, so perhaps we won't answer all of the questions today, but we would certainly keep track of them and continue to explore them as we go through the series. Christina, I just wanted to invite you, um, having had moderated the chat, were there any questions that had come up there? Um, and then we'll open it up to, to others. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Nareth. I do think we had some uh, really great comments from Dr. Paul Barich, and he really brought up a bit about these ethical questions. Um, algorithms can contain biases, they might skew results. Um, and, you know, we could even have a third party actor into the physician patient relationship. I don't know if you want to address any of those comments. Thanks. I think it's top of mind. And certainly, thankfully, it's becoming surfaced uh, a lot more. We'll be talking more about bias um, in a later series, starting to explore it with Eric's uh, talk next time. I think that the key thing around it is that, um, you know, uh, this, uh, there's sort of two ways that we I think about bias, and I'll let Igal answer next, which is the idea, is there intentional bias or there is there a implicit bias? And the challenge is that, you know, the data that's being fed into these algorithms um, needs to come from a source that can generate large quantities of that. And that tends to be the world as it exists today. Right? And that unfortunately has within it many um, implicit biases. And so even if you remove things that would be thought to be charged, for example, race or gender from the model, um, it can still create associations that are effectively associated with those variables. <clears throat> if, for example, you were making credit score predictions or other kinds of things. Um, the idea that people might be intentionally introducing into the algorithms bias, you know, I think a theoretical risk seems less likely in terms of the problems that people today are trying to solve for it. Igal, did you have anything else you would add? That's that's a really great question and great observation. Uh, clearly, uh, to Dara's point, it's it's first and foremost about uh, uh, really uh, you know variability in the data set that is being used and what we're trying to optimize for, right? So basically, uh, for, uh, you know, when we said, like, uh, you know, there are two key categories in terms of uh, what uh, those, uh, you know, models are uh, trying to, uh, you know, to help it, right? Classification and prediction. So then classification is really about the, having the, uh, you know, enough of a, a variability, uh, in, you know, introduced into the into the model to be able to basically capture that and to be able to you know to to do the classification in the best in the most inclusive uh, and uh, you know way possible, right? So and we know that there are you know many cases even recently, uh, especially in like social media, with uh, you know misclassifications that uh, those uh, some of the you know automatic uh, capabilities introduced in terms of like tagging, labeling, and social media. Uh, just, just just one of those examples. Uh, the second piece is really about prediction and. Uh, related to, um, you know, to what extent there is, a, a, you know, automated assignment that is happening based on classification versus uh, uh, basically providing the uh, choices and, and really provided the, you know, the, especially in the, in the learning space, providing the capabilities to select the most, uh, uh, the most probable, the most, uh, you know, desirable path uh, by the learner himself or herself. So these are 
uh, you know, really two major considerations, but clearly the uh, diversity inclusion in the uh, AI ML capabilities is very, very key area for, um, you know, for research and development. And we know that um, some of the key groups, uh, you know, we mentioned Samsung from Microsoft, Google, and, uh, you know, uh, other major players uh, really devoting a lot of uh, emphasis now to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, we will be able to optimize basically, and we will be able to create those capabilities that will be inclusive and diverse and based on really uh, representative data from all the groups and all the uh, all the all the use cases so definitely as i said we are going to uh, i think the the question about the ethics and uh, some of the applications what can be done what needs to be done uh, uh, we are basically building that into each of those uh, next webinars so we can you know talk about that in assessment space and in the, in every a discussion we will have. So clearly, this is one of the key topics for us to look at. Great. Thanks, Christina. Anything else? Yes, thank you. We did have a, a great comment by uh, Shuba. I don't know if she um, is able to unmute or uh, turn her camera on, um, but I will say the comment. She says that technology should be used um, uh, purposefully, right? We need to think about aligning the learning objectives and the outcomes with the technology rather than sort of like this technology is cool or this algorithm is cool. And so, I, I mean, I really like the idea of aligning things together and purposefully using this technology to make sure that we're achieving high quality learner outcomes. I don't know if you have a comment on that. And I think Eric also has a comment after this. Eric, is it related or a separate one? Uh, I'll throw mine out because it was more of a comment and it may relate to that to some degree and uh, maybe it's just food for thought for everyone and uh, sharing a little <clears throat> how my mind has evolved through this great talk. Um, and you guys can also correct me if my mind is headed off tangentially, but I was beginning to kind of reflect on, on the power of an intelligent system is perhaps driven in part by also the gold standard endpoint you're trying to achieve and you have to kind of adapt expectations to that. And, and here's the example. I began to reflect just that, like you mentioned, chess has a very simple set of rules and a clear endpoint. You either win or lose. Um, and therefore designing an intelligent system to hit that point is, is somewhat, I guess, not easy, but it's logical to think how that could happen. But whether you can assess whether someone's learned something or mastered something is a quite a nebulous thing. And in fact, the, the AAMC, if anything, has been moving after you know, EPAs and trustability. And trust is even more of a nebulous thing. But what caught my eye and, and, and brought me back is Egal's point of, of saying that intelligent systems, when you deal with that level of, of theoretical endpoint or, or a complex endpoint, intelligent systems can still make recommendations. They can create efficiencies they can work together with that complex human structure and probably intelligently make it better. So I don't know if I'm saying that right, but I wanted to throw that out there because that struck me in the last 50 minutes. Wonderful, thanks. Um, I, I think they, they do seem a little bit related in terms of like they're, they're addressing this idea of what's the endpoint um, of these systems and, and how that determines sort of how we'll interact with them. Um, this, in, in many ways, uh, rather than some other learning technologies where we've just applied them to the stuff that we already have, and we just presented them in a new way. Um, uh, if, if AI is, and especially machine learning is gonna be effective, I think according to Egal's model, you have to spend a lot of time defining both the, the data inputs that you're gonna feed into it, um, as well as how you're going to tell if you're getting the outcomes that you're interested in. Um, I think that, you know, I alluded to just, just briefly in terms of like why for example, in Watson, they tried many experiments, right, with uh, Sloan Kettering and MD Anderson to to use the technology to simply, you know, provide point of care resources um, to assist the physicians. But they weren't effective, you know, and failed prima facie when they presented their their recommendations at this time. So I would say that um, you know we've got a lot of work to do, uh, and I think it's going to force us to become more uh, defined both in clinical practice in terms of what are these real outcomes that we're looking for, and how do we track them effectively over time for all our patients, right? And then what's the data that we can bring into those? Um, and then I think that it's also going to help us and force us in the clinical education space to push us to say what is. <laughs> How are we assessing mastery, right? What does that really mean? What's super exciting is that we may be able to uh, 
to do things like automatic video analysis that they're doing in some surgical spaces where the AI watches the video. It doesn't tell you if it's good or bad. It just highlights key points. So instead of reviewing a two hour surgery, you review five minutes with your clinical mentor. That, that system itself with enough interactions, I think will teach us to say, yeah, there was a risk here that you were coming too near that artery and we might change it. Those are very exciting. Can we do the same thing for emotive interactions? And But the, like Egal said, it's probably going to be this hybrid intelligence that's going to be with us for a long time. And, and people interested in clinical education are going to help to make a big difference. Egal, your thoughts? Great discussion. I think we had some of the key uh, key points. I, I would just uh, encourage uh, you know us as a larger uh, you know team on those uh, on these webinars really to uh, to look into some of those uh, considerations. Really, what we are trying to optimize, for, you know, how we address some of the uh, ethical uh, you know concerns related to the use of AI and really uh, how we build for you know what Nara just mentioned as the a kind of hybrid model, you know, what what are the you know the the the, the learners learners or you know what are the best practices really to make sure that these capabilities uh, will be used in the most uh, uh, you know human centric way, right? As opposed to just like automation uh, that of course uh, is possible in some cases, but not in these complex cases such as you know medical education or uh, you know learning to reach mastery in general. Great. I think we are at time. So I just wanted to thank everyone. We'd welcome any uh, discussion points by email or contacting us. And certainly we look forward to seeing everyone in the follow-up sessions.